That's an original greeting. I've been watching the chapel services online and everyone that comes up here says, good morning. May I have some house lights? Because I want to see the faces of, may I? Ask and it shall be given. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, look at you. <laughs> we traveled 7,000 miles to be here with you today. Yay! I was talking to that mic like I thought it was the mic, but it's not. <laughs> I can move around, actually. I can move around. I want to say some things that are very important in my life. And I hope that in these next few minutes, these 20, 25 minutes, without using the all too dangerous word I, <laughs> that I'll be able to maybe share a little bit of my heart with you. I love this generation. That's why I came. You're the hope. And you have been fed such a load of crap from my generation, and I'm sorry for that. My generation believed that superficiality was more important than substance, but somehow that clicked in your head as being wrong. And my generation, especially in the church in America, believed that brick and mortar and buildings and $30 million Church buildings were more important than feeding the hungry, and I'm sorry for that because I think you don't believe that. So as I meet your generation, I see this great hope. It's, it's hopeful to me because you have this wonderful uh, bullcrap barometer, you know? And, and I love that. You know when people are like fake and inauthentic and that's stupid and that doesn't work, and, and you understand that. You understand community. My generation tried to push the individual, and you all said, no, 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 Jesus is about community, and you've done that really well. So I'm blessed and thrilled, because I love this generation. I do, I teach in Lithuania, my little, my little country of three million, and here I'm in Los Angeles, which is like, what, 15 million? Ugh, big difference. And my little country of Lithuania that we love so dearly has the highest suicide rate in the world. Bless their little hearts and they struggle and there's a lot of depression there and, oh, but we love them. We love our Lithuanians. I love my students. I teach at a secular university and uh, it's been a blessing for us to be there. Daryl and I have enjoyed serving there. This is the thing for me is um, a lot less is in front of us as in behind us. And I'm talking, you know, like time. And so we look at this as like our, ba our last big hurrah, right? Our last big thang. This is it. Because, you know, I'm 53, he's 61. I mean, unless Jesus returns, we're probably gonna die. And so we just figure, wow, let's, let's die boldly and maybe go out in a blaze. That's our plan. That's our, yeah. Yay, old people! Yeah! <laughs> so Lisa contacted me, awesome gifts in their misorganization gal, and she said, we're looking at proclaiming good news in a changing world. From this place, proclaiming good news in a changing world. And I like this concept, and I wanna break it into three things. The first thing I wanna ask you is, who's hogging all the water? Right? You look at Jesus, he does a great job of taking abstract, really bizarre concepts, right? And he's teaching just ordinary people and he brings those really hard to handle abstract ideas and he brings them down so they can understand and comprehend the concrete. You know, that's what good teachers do, right? The big rabbi, I mean, he is the rabbi, right? And so he brought that down, he said, you know what, I, I am water. I'm the living water. That's what Jesus tells us. He's the living water. And when we call on him and ask him to come and redeem our lives, he says, out of our bellies flows rivers of living water. I got lots of water to give, okay? I'm so thrilled that out of my belly, 
living water can flow. And it's interesting that Jesus would use this metaphor about water and him being water, because in the desert, there's not a lot of water. Yeah, and people need water. So he's like, you know the thing you're the most desperate for and the thing that you thirst the most for? I'm the answer. Because as you know, those of you who are followers of Jesus, you know that Jesus alone holds the cure to what ails the human soul. Only Jesus. No one else. So in the scripture, roll that beautiful bean tape. There we go. He says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, which I really like because I'm super loud. He said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So this gives us an incredible challenge. This gives us an awesome calling that we who know Jesus understand the only answer for what ails the human soul, and that's his living water. And then for whatever reason, I don't understand, God has called us to partner with him, right, to take this water and share it. Here, have a drink. That's why we're in Lithuania. We wanna help people understand Jesus and to be able to quench that thirst. Now there's an Arab Arabic proverb. I love this proverb. What's the greatest crime in the desert? Finding water and keeping silent. That's truth about Jesus. What's the greatest crime against humanity? Knowing the Savior, knowing this life giver, knowing the hope that Jesus is for humankind and keeping it on the down low keeping silent, it's a crime. Daryl and I have always thought about every night that we lay our heads on our pillows and experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. There's a fire in our bellies to tell anyone and everyone who will listen that Jesus has hope. Jesus is hope. Jesus is the redeemer. And it is our duty, our task to proclaim that. So I'm asking, who's hogging all the water? Today in our world, two billion people have never heard the name of Jesus. There are two billion. I can't even comprehend the size of Los Angeles, much less two billion people. Two billion people who've never heard the name of Jesus. They didn't reject Jesus. They didn't like choose Jesus over some other God, right? They didn't like reject him. They didn't uh, select something else. They just have never heard his name. It's shocking. That's like two billion people that are really thirsty for the living water of Jesus. And we who know where that source is, we have an obligation, don't we? Don't we have an obligation to proclaim that news? One of the things I think is funny is that Coca-Cola, because I looked at their website, Coca-Cola has said that they want to have a Coca-Cola in the hand of every person on the planet by the year 2025. Go look on their website. It's hilarious. A Coca-Cola in the reach. Okay, yeah, they said in the reach of every human being on the planet by the year 2025. Okay, guys, follow me on this one. I think reaching those two billion and reaching the loss with the gospel, all we have to do is follow the Coca-Cola trucks. Yeah? Right? Just follow the trucks. It's not impossible. And the great thing about that is Jesus said is when this good news is published and proclaimed to all nations, then he will come. And his coming is a really good thing because he fixes stuff. He fixes us and he fixes our broken world and there's no more hurricanes, right? And there's no more cancer. He's going to fix things. And he's going to let us watch and be a part of it and rule and reign. So I think that this reaching the two billion people, if you're just looking at you know, practical things, pragmatic things, we need to be busy. <laughs> it's doable, it's within our reach. 
Oh, these two billion people, the majority of them live in what we call that changing world. Do you know what I mean by creative access? Countries. Those are countries that, you know, you can't go up to and go, hi, my name's Terry, and I'd like to be missionary in your country. And then they give you a visa. Okay, that's a, that's, there's countries like that. And most of the two billion that we're talking about live in those countries. So we can't just go up there and say, hello, I want to come and win your nation to Jesus, and I need a visa to do that. It's not going to happen. Today, because of religion and politics, more and more borders, more and more nations are closed to the news of Jesus Christ in traditional means. Now, at the very end of this message, I will put my email address up on the PowerPoint, okay? Because some of you may want to talk to me about this, but I'm going to throw something out that might be a little bit controversial. Can you handle it? All right. We're being told. I've got a missiologist on this shoulder and a theologian on this shoulder, and they're shouting at me that the only viable mission is church planning and evangelism. Church planning and evangelism. And that if you are not presenting a direct salvation message when you do good deeds, you are in crime. You are breaking everything about the scripture by being a person who promotes the social gospel. The social gospel. Okay, I have a question. Social gospel, isn't that referring to society? And isn't society made up of people? And didn't Jesus come to love people? I just want us to think about something very carefully here. I have friends who will not go into nations where they cannot do church planting or evangelism. And I struggle with that because I think that Jesus has called us to feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and visit those in prison. And in my Bible, I can't see where he says, if they don't accept the good news and plan of salvation, stop doing that. And there's also an inauthentic thing that comes along with that agenda. We cannot be people who want to take every conversation hostage. My students would pick up on that first thing that if I was in Lithuania, just so that I could put notches in my spiritual gun belt, they would know, you don't love us. You have a hidden agenda. You don't care about me. You just want to sell me Amway or Jesus. <laughs> because there's something intrinsic in the human nature that says, I want to know that you love me because of who I am and that you care about me, and you feed me, and you clothe me, and you give me water because I'm significant. And as followers of Jesus, when we do that, with even the thought that I may never be able to speak Jesus' name to my students, I am loving them in Jesus' name. I'm praying for them in Jesus' name. I intercede on their behalf, but I can't take those conversations with them hostage, and I cannot manipulate every time we are interacting so that I can give them the four spiritual laws. And in some countries, that's not even allowed. So my precious brothers and sisters at Boyola, I wanna ask you if there might be something behind door number three. Here's what I'm thinking. In the Christian world, for those of us that follow Jesus, there should never be a separation between sacred and secular. All that we are and all that we do should be for the glory of God and because we love Jesus. Whether we are car mechanics or painting houses or feeding people or teaching linguistics at a secular university. That all that I am is to bring glory to God and be his fragrance. I want to smell good in Jesus' name. I want to bring the Holy Spirit's presence around me wherever I am. But I cannot trap people into conversations. 
I would go to North Korea today. I would go if I got invited to North Korea today, even if I knew there was no opportunity to ever speak Jesus' name. I would go to North Korea and I would quietly pray. I would love my students. I would ask the Holy Spirit to come and move on that nation because that could be part of what my calling is in tearing up that ground because maybe later on the Lord will bring seed sowers and water and a harvest. We were invited to go to Afghanistan. And you have to understand my my little Assembly of God mom I love my mom. She's 80 years old. She's so dear. I said, Mom, we went in 2003, and then Daryl and I went in 2006. I said, Mom, we're going to Afghanistan. She goes, oh, I'll just be praying. I'll get all my girlfriends to pray, and we'll just pray that you guys can just win people to Jesus. And I go, well, Mom, um, the United Nations is sponsoring us, and so is the um, Ministry of Higher Education in Afghanistan, and they've said that we can't talk about Jesus, and we can't proselytize, and we can't turn the lectern into a pulpit. Then why are you going? Why are you going there? And I said, because what we have to offer is our cold cup of water in Jesus' name. And we'll pray, and we'll worship, and we'll love them, and we'll do everything we can. But mom, we might not be able to say Jesus' name. And I think there is a school of thought that that was a waste of time. But borders are closing and doors are closing for traditional Christian witness. And we have to ask the Lord, what do we do? Because the gospel is not formulaic. As much as I wish it were, it's not formulaic. And there's sometimes when the Holy Spirit will move on us to be quiet and let that person mine the gospel out of us. And other times he might ask us to be bold and look foolish and embarrass ourselves. One time I was witnessing to a guy um, from Australia and I was so nervous about it, my face kept twitching. I'm sure that made him want to be a follower of Jesus. (laughs) As I was spastically trying to explain Christ. But I knew that's what Jesus wanted me to do. Other times when I lived in China in the early 80s, I had a teacher that I wanted so badly to tell about Jesus. Three years I wanted to tell this woman about Jesus. And every time I'd start to tell her, the Lord would shut my mouth. He would choke me. I would like, oh, no, uh, uh. When I left, a friend of mine told me she had been an informant for the Communist Party waiting for me to try to proselytize so she could kick the whole team out. Christ's love is not a formula. And presenting his love to others is not a formula. There are no four spiritual laws. There's no 10 keys. There's no road to help people. We just have to be ourselves. We have to be genuine. We have to love them. Be prepared to answer, right? Any of those who ask you, what is the source of the hope that is within you? So Daryl and I went to Afghanistan and we're teaching, and we've got four. There's four people on the team, and we're teaching, and we're working really hard. I'm doing philosophy of education seminars. I've got 30, 35 people in my room. We've been there for weeks just getting to know folks, and we're trying to draft this philosophy of education statement. And there was a guy in the classroom who everyone had kind of warned me about, and they called him a Taliban sympathizer. This was 2003. And so we just called him scary Taliban guy. Yeah, because he was, and he had the long beard, the only one, and he's like, wear the turban, and he's scary. And so one day, we're teaching, I'm working really hard to get this, the faculty, we're teaching faculty how to do a philosophy of education statement, get back into the classroom, and scary Taliban guy stood up in the middle of my lecture, not the first time, but still, and he said, Dr. Teddy, I do have a question. I'm like, okay, great. And he says, he says to me, do you believe in Muhammad? Trying to win-win, okay? Because I don't mind dying for Jesus. I don't want to be in prison. So I'm trying to think win-win. So I go, oh, Muhammad? He's a historical figure. Who wouldn't believe in Muhammad? Of course, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, right? He's like, no, that's not what I mean. Really? <laughs> he says, do you believe in Jesus? Deny me in man, and I will deny you in my father. So I'm working that one out, okay. So I'm like, 
yeah, and I think I'll throw him off the path by saying something insane. So I said, oh, Jesus, yeah, he's my very best friend. Because I thought if he thinks I'm crazy, he'll leave me alone. <laughs> he says, Muhammad is greater than Jesus. Oh, really? Wow. And then he says, say it. I learned a trick from my husband. Always ask what? It just gives you more time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. So I'm like, oh my gosh, what? And he goes, say, Muhammad is greater than Jesus. And you know, Anne Lamott says there's only two prayers. Help me, help me, help me. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was going, oh, help me. And, and I was in that tunic. I, you know, I had one of those tunics on. And my hair was in the thing. And I was shaking. I was going, oh, I'm going to die in a Taliban prison. <laughs> Dirty. So I start thinking, and I ask the Lord to help me. And you know that scripture where Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to say when they bring you before the magistrates. Don't worry that I'll give you the words. Never, ever meant anything to me until this moment. And I said, do you have a grandmother? <laughs> he took a direct hit. You could see. Oh. I said, do you have a grandmother? And he goes, well, of course I have a grandmother. That's not what I, I said. Because if I say what you tell me to say, it will bring shame to my village and break my grandmother's heart. Do you want to break my grandmother's heart and want me to bring shame to my village where my parents can never lift their heads again? Is that what you want? He's like, no, that, that's not my God. I go, because that will, that's what would happen if I said what you said. And he's like, no, 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 that's not my meaning. That's not my meaning. And he's frustrated. And one of the senior teachers, all heads had been down, right? Finally, one of the senior teachers, he looks up and he goes, Dr. Terry, can I to say something? I'm like, as long as it's not kill the white woman, yes. <laughs> so he stands up and he says, we know Dr. Terry is a follower of Jesus because Jesus was a great and wonderful teacher and so is she. And in the Quran, it is written that God will reveal himself to any man, woman, or child, whether they seek him in a church or a temple or a mosque. He said, even Jesus wouldn't ask her, I mean, even Muhammad wouldn't ask her to say what you're asking her to say. And the bell rings. Thank God for the bell. And it's lunchtime, and this is the only hot meal they get all week, right? This one each day. And so they all leave to go for the hot meal, except four men. And I'm shuffling paper on my desk, because I'm scared. <laughs> so I'm like, la, la, busy. And the four men walk up, and they go, Dr. Teddy, can we speak with you? And I'm like, mm, sure. I wonder where Daryl is, right? And they said, Dr. Terry, all of our lives we have wanted to know Jesus, and we've never met anyone who followed him. Do you have any articles or things we can read to help us know about Jesus? We had a little something, something called the God. <laughs> we had the Gospel of John in Pashtu and Farsi. We had stuck those in. You see, I didn't have to go into that classroom and manipulate or cohort or try to coerce people or be phony or sell them a bill of goods. I just had to show up and Jesus showed up too. I just had to be who I was, doing what God called me to do, and four men through the Gospel of John got to hear about Jesus and who he is and what he does in our lives. So, here's the closing thing as the time is literally running out. First of all, you hold living water if you know Jesus Christ. Secondly, there are two billion people on this planet who've never heard his name, and I believe we have a responsibility to take them that living water. And the third thing is, we might have to find new and creative ways to do that, but we ask for the Holy Spirit to lead us and to be obedient. As we surrender and walk in obedience, we don't have to be manipulative, and we don't have to have false agendas. We can be who we are, sacred and holy work unto God, and he will make a way 
for us to have those important and life-changing conversations. Viola, brothers and sisters, if you have questions or comments or you want to give feedback, please email me. Let me know. We're going to put that beautiful email address up there. And in the last minute that we have together, I'd like to pray for you. Would that be okay? Father God, I pray in Jesus' name for these students, these dear ones, each one you know their name, you have made a masterpiece, you have works that you planned for them before the foundations of the earth were laid. May they have boldness to go in scary places. May they be filled with the fragrance of Christ and may they hear your Holy Spirit to walk in obedience as we proclaim that Jesus is the healer of the human race. We commit all these two billion to you, Lord God, and ask you, the Lord of the harvest, to throw workers into the harvest fields. And we ask all of these things in the beautiful and wonderful, life-giving name of Jesus. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.